Uh, I'd like to talk through some of the chapters uh, 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 that you have in your book uh, uh, and, and, and some of the things that uh, social entrepreneurs should be thinking about. So to, to begin with, uh, you recommend that social entrepreneurs need to articulate the problem uh, that they are trying to solve as well as a solution that they propose to offer. Could you take us through some of the steps that they should go through to do that? Uh, what we try to do is push people in, into thinking beyond just sort of a high-level problem. There's a problem of nutrition or there's a problem of education. And begin to think a little bit about what it is that the, uh, the so-called beneficiaries of this program are going to actually receive and, and what the problem is from their perspective and whether they recognize that they have a problem. So for instance, in one of the projects, and you relate to this thing, uh, Makul in, in, in India, was the, the concept of taking sachets of uh, disinfectant and distributing it in villages where the, uh, the water was uh, unhygienic and people were subject to all sort of uh, dysent dysentery type diseases, gastric diseases and high death rates and so on. When you arrive in the village, it's not evident to the people in that village who have very little education that the, or the connection between the diuretic diseases and the water. And if you tell them that the water is bad and they can't see the microbes or bacteria in that, they just don't believe you. So, you know, it, it's really important to understand the problem, not just from the point of view of the benefactor, but also from the point of view of the beneficiary. And so what we do in the book is we start to give them very systematic ways of beginning to unfold uh, what the problem is in the, eyes of the, in the eyes of the person who's supposed to benefit. One other chapter in your book refers to uh, the need to segment the target population. Uh, I, I, Jim, I wonder if you could help explain how the, this process should work. Um, Mukul mentioned in his, uh, Mukul, uh, to your question, Mac mentioned in, in his uh, first uh, response, this idea of, of finding you know, a group of these beneficiaries or a segment of them that has a higher likelihood of early adoption of what it is you're trying to do than you know, others perhaps. And again, in the spirit of uh, efficient use of resources, and learning and you know, the reduction of, 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 of risk and uncertainty. What we, we spend an entire chapter doing is framing a method for segmenting the beneficiaries. And you know, it's some of the typical segmentation uh, instruments, geographic location, gender, all of that. But then there are also behavioral segmentation issues. So what we have is we have a framework for people to use to segment their beneficiaries, and then to select one with which to start. And we articulate the, you know, the characteristics of a good uh, wedge, if you will, um, uh, and, and, and hopefully a segment that, that is most likely to adopt in the shortest space of time at the lowest cost and provides you know, a high rate of learning. So that's, you know, there's a whole chapter devoted to that. Now, as uh, Mac has used it before, sometimes a seemingly wonderful idea leaves the beneficiaries cold and unresponsive. Uh, uh, why, why does that happen? And what could social entrepreneurs do to uh, prevent their enterprises from falling into that trap? Well, the, you know, the, 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 the fundamental problem is that people come in with what I call their wild-eyed Western solution to a problem where you, you're expecting behaviors to take place in, in defiance almost of deep-seated cultural behaviors. There's some things that you know you just don't do. So one of the projects that we looked at when I was in uh, Cape Town a couple of years ago was the whole idea of uh, beginning to distribute uh, tricycles, three-wheel bicycles, so that women, instead of having to carry uh, their crops to the market, could actually pedal their crops to the market. And that sounds like a wonderful idea, but when you arrive with the bicycles, you find out that the, the men have decided that women should not ride bicycles. That's something only a man's allowed to do. So there's, you know, by not paying attention to what the cultural factors are, they just, they just wasted their time. 
and, and it's that type of thing, uh, going in with uh, condoms uh, to try and prevent AIDS and you don't take into account the fact that uh, in many of the African societies, uh, facil uh, fertility is extremely uh, well regarded. A fertile woman, a woman must be fertile. And then secondly, the sexual behavior is not taken into account. And this woman goes to her husband and says, uh, you know, I expect you to use a condom. You've got to be kidding. She can get thrown out of that house. She can get sent back to her original family and, and live the rest of her life in disgrace because her husband has banned her from his home. You know, so this lack of, of uh, cultural sensitivity is often a huge problem. Why is it important for social entrepreneurs to identify the most competitive alternatives to the idea that they're trying to propose? Uh, and how can they use this information that they gather to make their own offering more valuable? There's always a competitor, Mukul. As you know, Mac alluded to it earlier, even if it's what they're doing today, and we stress this because it forces people, and we've done this ourselves, it forces people into that environment and to spend time with their, you know, the beneficiaries they have in mind and the communities at large. And by mapping out what the nearest alternative is to what you know, the team has in mind, in effect, we're forcing them to build insight into the realities of that you know, sector of the population on the ground as it exists. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is it gives a, a methodical uh, manner with which to compare step by step the idea that a team has for a social entrepreneurship activity versus what exists on the ground or could exist on the ground. And so we use that to force people to get the kind of information that they should have and then to have a, a fairly hard look at what it is they propose and how it compares from the beneficiary's perspective with what they're already doing. Mac, what operational issues uh, do social entrepreneurs need to address before they can deliver their product or service? This is so important that we actually have the, uh, the would-be social entrepreneur develop what, what we call a deliverables table, uh, where the, you need to be very clearly focused on articulating everything that the beneficiary must go through in order to receive the benefit. And then think a little bit about what it's going to take for that benefit to take place. So. Uh, Let's say you've got a program in which you're distributing product to uh, village communities out, you know, out in the boonies, as they say. Uh, you can't just assume that there's going to be a transportation system that will deliver that stuff. You have to think a little bit about not just how is the product going to be sold, but how is the product going to be transported to where you want it sold. How are we going to know that we need to send more? Do we have a logistical system in place? Because in, in many of these uh, situations, there just isn't the infrastructure to do it. So what we're looking at here is uh, what specific operations from the time that the beneficiary first becomes aware that they have a need and you can fix it uh, through uh, the final delivery and consumption of that uh, be benefit has to be documented. And then you've got to sit down and sort of say, what physically must happen? Because uh, if the system isn't there, it just ain't going to happen. Uh, here, here was one project, I, I think just in terms of the illustrated. They had a program in Lesotho uh, in which they were going to deliver uh, medicines by motorbike. Because Lesotho's got very bad roads, but you can go on motorbikes to many of these places. So they built this whole program with... Uh, you know, uh, dozens of uh, motorbike riders taking, taking samples and taking uh, medicines out to remote areas. And everything went fine until the motorbikes started breaking down. And then they suddenly found out that there was no one there to repair the motorbikes. So what you now have is like a mountain of unused motorbikes in a, uh, that, that have basically just gone to waste. The, 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 the next question is actually for both of you. Uh, one of the things I found most fascinating about your book is the examples that you give of two companies, uh, Zambia Feeds and Ecotact, 
uh, and how they went through the different steps that you've just outlined. So could you tell the Knowledge at Wharton audience about these two companies and what are the main lessons that other social entrepreneurs can learn from their experience? Zambia Feeds is, is a company in the northwestern part of Zambia that basically produces fairly high quality animal feed at uh, relatively good prices. And uh, the company started uh, back in 2000, somewhere there, um, and has systematically uh, built an alternative production system for poultry rearing in that region. Um, at the end of last year, they had nearly uh, 2,000 customers um, producing fairly efficiently really high quality poultry. Um, so of course this had to scale over more than a decade. Uh, the first thing um, when we learned of this uh, that we did was to sit down with the entrepreneur and say alright what is success for you and uh, how do you know when you've got there. And as simple as that sounds, it turns out that a lot of folks don't really think like that. The reason we did it was because of the huge uncertainty in the area. And um, we put in place a few parameters um, that the team needed to, to commit to um, in order for us you know, to continue working with them. Not, that, you know, not to be arrogant, but you know, uh, we, we, we didn't want to commit ourselves to a team of people that was going to use the conventional, you know, let's come up with a great idea, raise the money and go and build it approach. And fortunately, uh, the team over there did. Um, now, we can't take all the credit. We were working with a social entrepreneur from that environment. And she had done this before. Not this kind of activity, but she'd been in, in, in commerce before. So uh, they started small, you know, as the book is. The, Pick your segments, geographic location, accessibility, etc. Didn't buy news, you know, used equipment. Didn't buy buildings. Uh, attended to the socio-politics by starting it as an entrepreneurial venture within an existing company, a big company that could provide some defense from interference. And um, they then spent the better part of, of nearly seven years building an organization that systematically uh, developed these new segments and in keeping with the philosophy of the book only began to accrue assets, you know, production assets, when they needed to, to accrue those, uh, the, those assets to produce higher volumes at higher quality. And fortunately for us, that case was the first one we took on and it's been very, very successful. In fact, they've impacted the, the, the whole industry in the country um, to the degree where the entrepreneur, when she retired last year, was on the, the National Poultry Association uh, board. Um, and we use that case throughout the book as you know, the kind of golden thread from the beginning through the end um, as a way to show what was done um, and it's, it's the applicability of each of the tools and frameworks to the case. Right. The other really interesting case you have is uh, of a company called Ecotact. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us about that one too? Mac, do you want to take well, this? Well, Ecotact was not something that we actually worked on, but uh, this was a project that one of the Wharton students was involved in. And uh, when she took the course uh, that we were teaching in entrepreneurship here, uh, what she did is start to bring to bear the whole concept that uh, a gentleman called David Correa uh, uh, put together to provide sanitation facilities uh, for people who, you know, were just basically using the streets. And uh, the interesting thing there is the, is the segmentation of the markets because uh, inadequate sanitation is a huge problem. You know, millions of people die every year under the age of five because of the diseases caused by inadequate sanitation. And part of the challenge in the beginning was uh, what we want to try to do is build these toilets which were f you know, uh, functional uh, and were sanitary, but uh, people were used to just using the streets. 
and and uh, and ditches and and things like that. And uh, you, his problem is he had to charge money for them to use these toilets, these facilities, and people were basically thinking to themselves, why the hell should I can pay when I can do it for nothing? So the perceptual breakthrough uh, was, was, was enormous. And so as he started to segment, he had to think a little bit about, make a uh, distinction between the places where there are many, many people, like in what they call the estates, which are basically the, uh, the slums uh, in the East African towns, uh, where there were hundreds of thousands of people who were exposed to unsanitary conditions. Uh, people in the towns where you had uh, uh, municipal toilets, uh, but which were very, very badly maintained and just basically not kept clean. And, and then people who could not just avail themselves of, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, facilities uh, at night where nobody could see them. But, uh, uh, and, and, and so as he started to focus in on which segment to go to, he said, let, let me try to find a place where uh, people cannot, uh, you know, cannot do it in, in the open and then secondly, where people do have some money. And so the segment he chose was markets because people come to the markets, they're there all day at the markets. And, uh, and people who come to markets tend either to sell or to buy, and that means they got some money. And so he got the whole thing started by building in, 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 uh, in markets. Now, the interesting thing about that particular project is that uh, there were two what we call uh, unexpected or, uh, outcomes. Uh, the first one was that these facilities that he built near the markets became attractive to women who were going to give birth to children. Because this was a place where you could go and give birth to your child and it was clean and it was sanitary. And so it became a, a, a birthing destination and not just a you know, sort of defecation destination. And so there was an unexpected consequence of what they were trying to do. And, uh, the, uh, the other thing that they found is that uh, the places where there were congregations of people with money uh, were not only just markets, but also uh, shelter, bus, bus uh, uh, shelters, places where buses congregated, because large numbers of people go backwards and forwards uh, all the time, uh, catching buses to and from the town. And so they, in a way, discovered what the true segment was for that particular f uh, form of enterprise. Uh, neither of which had been anticipated in the beginning. But fortunately, he didn't go and build, you know, a, a huge network of, uh, of, of toilets which no one was going to use. That's a great example. And, and so to end, you know, I, I, I wonder, what would you like Knowledge at Wharton's readers and viewers to do uh, to participate in your project uh, so that you, you can move it on to the next phase? Jim, what do you want? When did you go? Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> Firstly, to read it. Um, we, we've taken a slightly different approach in the publication of this book, as you know. Um, there's this e-book uh, that's going out pre-launch of the full book. And what we're trying to do is use it, you know, in the spirit of, uh, of, of the approach of the book, you know, st start small uh, and, and change fast is we'd like to get responses from readers out there and we're going to use those, not every response but we're going to use those responses to tweak if you will the balance of the book uh, pre final publication um, in uh, October November this year and the third thing is spread the word uh, you know if if any of our readers uh, are in the space, you know, use the book to spread the word. And if any of our readers know people in the space, uh, please get the book out there. Um, we think it'll be useful and everybody we've tested it with has found it very, very useful in the field, non-profit or for-profit. So hopefully our readers can help us do that. Mac, any final words? Yeah, you know, the basic uh, strategy at the moment is, is our e-books, a free book. We want to we wanna give anybody access to it if they want to download the first piece, which is the due diligence piece, which will help people really think through if they want to do something uh, that's going to do some good out there. And increasingly, people want to do that, particularly the younger generation. So uh, the idea is that if you, if you know of anybody who might be interested, 
just send them the the, uh, the address, the the URL, and they can download it. It's theirs. We don't want to make money out of this. Uh, what we want to do is 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 have impact. And uh, uh, you know anybody who you know who's making charitable contributions and may be a little concerned about how well those contributions are being uh, spent and dispersed, uh, send them the, the e-book and they can have a look at it because if I'm, I mean, I make donations. Uh, I want to be able to think that my donations are being spent well rather than, you know, just spent uh, uh, squandered. And uh, the, uh, the idea would be is that uh, anybody who's making donations today might want to have a look at it and then challenge the people to whom they're making the donations to see whether they're in fact following the disciplines we suggest. Uh, to me, this is not a popularity contest. You know, we're not there to be popular, we're there to have impact. Right. Well, Mac, Jim, thank you so much for speaking sure. with Knowledge at Wharton. Yeah, well, thank well, you. It's, uh, it's, thanks uh, so it was much, good Michael. to chat to you.